The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. Thus is the case in tonight's story. Time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. Detective Spencer shook his balding head in quiet dismay and disgust. In his 15 years of foot patrol and another aide as a homicide detective, he was seldom incredulous, but this was a different case. This case disturbed him like no other. He shook his head again and lit a cigarette. It was late and he was alone in the office. Tomorrow he would deny smoking in the workplace, should anyone smell the residual rancid odour of his cheap cigarettes, and accuse him of violating policy. Oh, he needed a cigarette, and he needed it now. A cigarette would stop his hands from trembling. What the hell, he thought. What the hell? He'd been pretty certain he'd seen it all, that nothing could get to him. His years in the New Orleans Police Department homicide unit had left him more than a little jaded. He'd seen dozens of senseless drive-by shootings that had killed innocent children. He'd worked a case where the suspected murderer had stashed his wife in a freezer in the garage before reporting her missing. He'd seen voodoo rituals that offered sacrifices of goats and humans. Well, just last year the detective arrested a woman who had, allegedly, decided to devour the remains of her husband on sequential Sunday dinners. Each week, she kindly invited her in-laws to partake. When is Sammy coming home? The recently deceased sister and mother would invariably ask. Oh, I suspect he'll be with us soon, the woman would answer and smile. This particular perp had come close to having committed the perfect crime and would have likely spent her remaining years sunning herself on a Bahamian beach had her mother-in-law not shown up early one Sunday and peeked in the slow cooker. Sammy's mother's screams were heard blocks away. The woman, more than a little distraught, arms flailing, ran into the street where she was struck by a passing car. The female perp had been convicted of murder one. The last of Sammy was found simmering on high in the crock pot and was buried next to his mother in the St. Claude Cemetery. Just after this collar, Detective Spencer asked for a transfer to the Special Crimes Unit. He knew instinctively he needed a break from the insanity of eight years in homicide. Yes, the detective was pretty sure nothing could affect him. That is, until now. Right, the New York detective responded. Touch base with me after you've seen her. And Detective Spencer? Yeah? Good luck. The blonde-haired girl in the sterile ICU bed wasn't much older than his daughter, the seasoned detective realized, when he finally got the okay to speak with her. She looked years younger than her chart indicated. She was 22, but in her blue hospital gown, and with her tousled hair framing her pretty face, she looked no older than 12 or 13. She had the long, thin body of a model, but had been relegated to working as a waitress in a tawdry French Quarter club. Such was the fate of so many young girls who found their way to New Orleans, looking for excitement and perhaps fame and fortune. They worked for the money until they either gave up the nightlife and married an oilfield worker, or more often than not, they returned to their hometowns to live the lives they had so detested. This girl didn't have too many options left to her, the detective thought. What the fuck would she do now? He tried not to look down at the hollow in the sheets where her feet should have been. Dark circles below her closed eyes encroached onto her cheeks. Her pretty face had morphed into a grotesque mask. What should have been the whites of her eyes were now red orbits, the vessels ruptured by incessant tears. She had cried until she could cry no longer. She had become numb with the help of another injection ordered by the compassionate doctor on duty that morning. Miss Robbins, the detective whispered, can you talk now? He asked, just above a whisper. I really need you to tell me anything you remember. The detective almost pleaded with the girl. The pretty girl opened her eyes to see a chubby, balding man standing at her side. The tears began to slide down her cheeks again. 
she said quietly. I don't think I can help you. I don't remember anything. You were working that night, right? The detective was encouraged just by hearing her voice. Yes, I worked until closing time, about 2 a.m. It was Friday night, you know, Saturday morning, so I figured there'd be a lot of people still out, especially on Decatur Street. So I went to get my car out of the parking lot. Had my keys in my hand, just like I always do when I go over there. And that's all I remember. I think someone hit me over the head. I don't know. I don't know. The tears were flowing in rivers now. I just remember bits and pieces. Like a dream. The girl continued. I remember... I remember something like a nursery rhyme. She spoke haltingly, and then I died. I died. It was so horrible, but I guess I came back. <laughs> she sobbed. When I woke up, I was like this. I just woke up like this. She almost screamed, like this. She convulsed into a low wail, like this. You're sure that was Friday night, Miss Robbins? Yes, last night, the girl replied. The detective didn't want to panic his witness, but today was Tuesday. She'd been somewhere for the last three days before being discovered in a heap behind a dumpster near the river. Determining where she'd spent those three days would be the key to this investigation. And you don't remember anything strange or different when you went to your car Friday night, the detective asked. The girl could only shake her head and sob. Please call me if you remember anything, Miss Robbins. The detective handed her his card with his private phone number. And don't you worry. We're going to get this son of a bitch. You have my word on it. He was such a good boy. He never asked for anything. He never expected anything. He was always smiling and ready to give hugs to everyone. Oh, he's such a good little boy. His mother would exclaim to anyone who would listen. He's a terribly good boy, she would add lovingly. Alexander and his mother were close. They only had each other. Alexander's father wasn't around much, and when he was, a horrible tension filled the little house. Alexander and his mother tiptoed around so they would not disturb the sleeping giant. They never knew if the man would be happy, offering smiles and kisses or if he might be surly and hateful, offering only slaps of open hands for Alexander and fists of anger toward his wife. Alexander was only three and had no idea that this family dynamic was not the norm. He accepted his life as it was and loved his parents as only a three-year-old could. Alexander had watched his mother grow wan. It seemed as though she was wasting away, slowly becoming invisible. He didn't know she was sick with cancer. He didn't know she'd been beaten almost to death by his father just the night before. She'd suffered the blows silently, not wanting to awaken her son. Several blows had landed on the side of her head, and her left cheek and eye were black and swollen. She cried silently most of the night, but this morning she smiled at Alexander and could have won an Academy Award for her acting as though nothing was wrong. She prepared Alexander's favorite breakfast of pancakes with chocolate chips and syrup, and the little boy was happy. After breakfast, his mother took him into the bedroom, and they propped themselves up against the aging headboard with worn, flattened pillows. Alexander's mother began to read his favorite book of children's rhymes, and finally came to his favorite. This little piggy went to market. She said in a high voice as she tugged at Alexander's slipper until it came off in her hand. This little piggy stayed home, she continued, and tweaked his toe with her thumb and middle finger. Alexander squealed. This little piggy had roast beef. She pulled at his third toe, and Alexander laughed and laughed. And this little piggy had none. His mother elicited another delighted squeal from Alexander. And this little piggy... She spoke slowly, and Alexander almost screamed with anticipation cried, wee, 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 all the way home. Alexander was ecstatic. 
He could picture each little piggy, and his favourite, of course, was the little one. When his mother kissed his little toe until he screamed with absolute delight. He was a happy child. He was such a sweet little boy. Alexander was still grinning as his mother raised herself from the heap of pillows and went to the dresser. She opened the top drawer, deliberately turning the little bronze key that kept the drawer locked. I love you, my sweet baby, she said, and raised a grey object to her head. Love you, mommy, Alexander said, but the loud crack from the gun erased his words. Blood and brain spattered onto his pyjamas, and his mother lay motionless on the floor. Alexander knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. He saw the gun. He knew about guns from watching television. He knew guns could hurt people, and he knew his mother was hurt. She wouldn't wake up. Half of her head had landed on the wall behind her. The huge smear of blood looked like a child's grotesque finger painting. Something was wrong. Something was horribly wrong. Mommy, please wake up, Alexander cried. Please, Mommy, wake up. He knelt at her lifeless body and then rested his head against her chest. He lay with his mother, feeling her slowly becoming stiff and cold, until his father came home hours later. Alexander's happy life ended that day. His father claimed he couldn't take care of the boy hold a job as well, so Alexander was turned over to the state and spent the next fourteen years in a myriad of foster homes. He was a troubled child, every foster parent claimed. He was a terribly unhappy and troubled child. Alexander left his last foster home as soon as he came of age. He moved to New York City. Copies of the New York cases were forwarded to the NOPD in care of Detective Spencer. All 1,738 pages of them. The files consisted of five unsolved homicide cases. The first victim was a dancer who lived in the village, not far from where her body was found, sans feet. There had been no effort to cauterize her wounds. The coroner's report stated cause of death as exsanguination. The second and third victims were found in Brooklyn within two weeks of each other, abducted from and later dumped in what was considered a relatively safe residential area, again seemingly unharmed other than the obvious detail of having had their feet removed. COD undetermined. The final two victims in the New York area were found in Queens, near the Triborough Bridge. Their feet were missing, but these cases differed in that their wounds were clumsily cauterized, probably with a blowtorch. This seemed to be the perp's first attempt to stop his victims from bleeding out. The two victims' respective coroner's report stated it was impossible to determine the exact instrument used to remove the feet. The coroner had, however, determined the first five victims had suffered blunt dissection of the leg and foot by a relatively sharp weapon, probably an axe. Sarah Robbins the pretty girl in ICU, was apparently the sixth victim and the first one to survive. There was a final important piece of evidence in the hundreds of pages that the detective poured through, the toxicology reports. Four of the five New York victims had positive findings for ketamine, a new and powerful anesthesia. The first victim had been found clean for the drug. She had definitely been a bleed-out. The remaining four victims were determined to have been administered ketamine in a dosage four times stronger than would normally be delivered in an operating theatre. While it was likely that the four women had died from an overdose of the drug, due to the severe exsanguination evident, it was impossible to ascertain the exact cause of death. It was most likely a combination of the two factors. Detective Spencer picked up the phone and called the Grace of God Hospital Lab identified himself with a special department pass number, and asked for Sarah's toxicology report. Positive for ketamine. The detective closed the folders on his desk. It looked as though his perp had ascertained the correct dosage of the potent drug, and was now working on his surgical specialty of amputation and subsequent cautery. By the looks of the five bodies in New York and Sarah in New Orleans, his surgical prowess was obviously lacking, but... He seemed to be trying. 
Ketamine had recently been approved by the FDA and was administered only in closely monitored cases and in those instances where other anaesthetics were contraindicated. It was known for its near-death or death-like experiences in many patients. It apparently mimicked the chemical release that occurred at the moment of death. None of the six victims had been sexually assaulted. There had been no overt signs of torture. Oh, it's so obvious, the detective realised. The perp didn't want to kill his victims. He didn't want some kind of perverted sex. He only wanted to garner his victims' feet. He was simply a collector. Sarah was his only link to the foot collector, as the perp was quickly dubbed by the NOPD. Detective Spencer's new partner was just off the beat, having passed his detective exam a few weeks ago. He was young, but he was sharp. He jumped into the case with both feet, and seemed as dedicated as his older protégé in his desire to nab this bastard. Spencer was concerned with his young partner's blind determination to solve his first big case. The older detective had witnessed too many young cops' lives unceremoniously lost in their unbridled enthusiasm. He'd seen one too many lay in the street dying from some stupid rookie mistake. So, you think this guy has some kind of foot fetish, boss? The young detective asked. He'd taken to calling his partner boss, and the older detective didn't correct his young psyche. Not in the uh, sexual sense of the word, detective. The older detective answered. He tagged his young partner kid, but realised using that term might be considered demeaning, and so he answered formally. I think this guy has some other reason for his particular affinity. I'm not sure we'll ever figure it out. It's freaking sick, Detective Barnett lamented. I think we need to interview the victim again. She's got to be more lucid now that the drugs have worn off. Let's go then, Spencer agreed. When the two men arrived at the hospital, they found Sarah had been moved into a private room. Her back to the door, she stared at the walls and didn't move as the two men clumsily made their way to her bedside. Miss Robbins, can we talk to you for a minute? Detective Spencer asked and was surprised by the softness of his usually gruff voice. There was only silence from the girl in the hospital bed. Sarah, Detective Barnett tried. We really need to talk to you before this bastard hurts someone else. Please. Sarah turned to face the two detectives. What do you want to know? She asked dully. I've told you everything I know. Everything I remember. You've been very helpful, the older detective said. There's just one thing I want to talk to you about. I know you said you felt as though you'd died. You were injected with ketamine, and that sometimes mimics the death experience. The girl did not react. The older detective continued. The other thing is, you said you remembered a fairy tale, a child's rhyme. Do you remember anything else about that? The detective asked, not really expecting an answer. He said it over and over and over, Sarah whispered softly. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none, and this little piggy cried wee wee all the way home, she said, slowly and deliberately. This little. And the connection was made. The awful, horrible connection she would have to live with for the remainder of her life. The light bulb had gone off for the detectives as soon as she began the rhyme. Everything was connecting. There was only one thing for the detective to do now. Find the man. The monster who recited this children's poem before he chopped off yet another victim's feet. After his determination that he needed something to effectively quiet his victims, to keep them from crying, he managed to procure a drug from the sometimes locked cabinet in the lab in the hospital where he worked. It hadn't been that difficult. After experimenting with the dosage, he realized if he administered too much of the drug, his girls would likely die fairly quickly, and he was sorry for that. That certainly was not his intent. 
Practice makes perfect, he said to no one. He tried again, and again. He didn't want his girls to die. He only wanted a little souvenir. A perfect pair of ten pretty toes. Something to extend his happiness just a little bit longer. He'd learned from his mistakes. His last girl had been a smashing success. Everyone in New Orleans was talking about it. And he wanted everyone to be as happy as he was. The NOPD quickly put a lid on the story, and the two detectives knew that they had to act fast on their threat of a lead. This guy had access to ketamine. This guy either worked in a lab or in a hospital. From his M.O., Detective Spencer was pretty certain the bastard for whom they were searching did not hold a professional position, as evidenced by the obvious lack of medical expertise. Tomorrow... They would begin checking every hospital in the city for drug reports that were off, especially for ketamine. They would find him. Their sense of urgency was intense. The adrenaline that pumped in a constant rhythm through the older detective system made him feel twenty years younger for a few days, and then served only to keep him awake late into the night. He had not shaved in days, and his suits were wrinkled. Were it not for the Jack Daniels that finally stopped his brain from rummaging incessantly at night, he wouldn't have been able to function. Oh, thank God for Jack, he muttered aloud as he passed out. The New Orleans press had discovered Sarah and two policemen were stationed outside her door 24-7, so not so much as a security precaution, but rather to keep the press at bay. The city paper ran the story. Serial foot collector in New Orleans. Women take precautions. At first glance, some readers thought the story was a spoof. Foot collector? What on earth was that? But the line, women take precautions, belied the more serious content of the story, which was read by almost everyone in the city. The details were sparse, but they were enough to engage the public's imagination, and soon the story, as incomplete as it was, became the number one news item on the local TV stations. Detective Spencer was furious. The publicity could easily serve to chase the perp out of the city, out of the media spotlight, and out of their grounds. Alexander didn't watch television, didn't own a set. Every evening when he returned home from his janitorial job at the hospital, he amused himself and passed the hours at home by carefully lifting one or two more of the heavy gallon jars from a specially enclosed set of shelves he'd built in his closet. Sometimes he took all twelve jars down and placed the correct pairs together in a neat row. Oh, he reveled in his work. When he was feeling a bit silly, he'd mix the feet up, six lefts and six rights. They were unlimited arrangements he'd discovered. He would smile as he remembered how much fun he had wriggling his girls that's what he liked to call the women he brought home. His girls. Wriggling his girl's beautiful white toes, he lovingly recited the little piggy's poem to them. He couldn't understand why the girls would cry. It was a beautiful rhyme. He didn't want them to cry, so he began to give them something to help them keep quiet. Something to keep them from crying. A sedation, he called it. Some medicine he'd stolen from the hospital. He gave the girls a little if they cried too much, and he gave them more before he took the souvenirs. He kept them still. His girls would lay silent on the little bed. They didn't cry. And then he could play little piggies on their pretty toes for hours, and he was happy. He was so happy. He had made some serious mistakes with his first girl. She just wouldn't stop crying, and he had no idea what to do. He ended up taping her mouth closed with duct tape and taking her feet in a hurry. He'd barely played his game with her at all. After procuring his trophies, he quickly disposed of the body in a dumpster not far from his own apartment building in Chelsea and realised later he'd been pretty stupid. He also realised he was lucky, but he could not contain his desires and he was on the prowl again within a few weeks, this time in a neighbourhood across the Brooklyn Bridge. It was so easy. 
He simply watched a girl he wanted, and followed her for a week or so to figure out what hour she worked and how she got home. The girls who drove their own cars were the easiest. They thought they were so brave, going to their cars alone at night. They were easy pickings. After a week or so, Alexander simply hid behind a nearby car, and when his girl was distracted, unlocking her car door, he came up behind her and pressed the cloth to her nose. She struggled a bit. This was by far the most dangerous thirty seconds of the abduction, or the catch, as Alexander called it. When his girl went limp, he put his arm around her waist and pretended she'd had too much to drink, steering her easily to his car which he had parked just a few spaces away. Once inside the back of his car, she was his. His apartment was little more than a shed behind a big house in a ritzy uptown neighborhood, and his driver went all the way to his door. No one ever saw him come or go. His little dwelling consisted of a living room, kitchen and bedroom. In the bedroom was a large closet which held his most precious possessions, his collection. He'd thought to make a special place. He didn't like the term hide, no, a special place to keep his collection. And should anyone enter his abode uninvited, and everyone other than his girls was uninvited, no one would ever find his cachet. His bedroom was large enough to hold both his full-size bed and another twin bed he converted into a sofa when he wasn't using it for one of his girls. When he had company, he used a thick sheet of vinyl to cover the little bed. After he'd garnered his souvenirs, he simply folded the vinyl and threw it away in a big, brown garbage bag. He never kept his girls for more than a few days, and he had to work around his days off at the hospital. He was never concerned about one of his girls screaming to alert someone to her plight. He simply put a thick piece of duct tape over their mouths. He removed it now and again to give them water, and should they eventually pee, the vinyl would catch it. Most of the time, they just lay there, and that was fine with him. True, he would have enjoyed it more if they'd been awake when he recited his poem and played with their little toes, but most of his girls had cried when he suggested they join him in his fun. He really didn't like to see girls cry, so he found that the sedation would keep them quiet, and when they were quiet, he could play with their toes at length, without any annoying distraction. In a few hours, he would catch another girl. She would be lucky number seven. He would have seven beautiful pairs of toes with which to play, and that would make him very happy. Alexander had watched this new girl for several weeks now, she worked in the same hospital as he did, and although he usually chose a prettier girl, and one with which he had no association whatsoever, he'd been immediately smitten with this one. This one was special. She worked in the gift shop and had worn sandals one summer day, sandals without stockings. Her toenails were meticulously trimmed and painted with a deep burgundy polish. He'd never seen anything like it. Toes peeked at him from beneath the leather strap of her shoes, and he thought he would faint from sheer joy. He waited patiently for her, and at eight o'clock, she closed the gift shop and walked outside, never once imagining that she might be in any danger. Alexander followed his new girl halfway down the block into the parking garage just across the street. He watched as the elevator light went to the third floor and stopped. About a minute later, a blue Toyota Prius purred down the cement ramp to the exit booth. There was no attendant on duty, and the new girl swiped her ticket to urge the yellow bar to rise. The Prius exited the garage, the new girl safely inside, and Alexander smiled. This was too easy. A week later, Alexander could not wait a day longer. He would catch her tonight after he finished work and had something to eat. He would find her car in the garage, careful not to be noted by any cameras, and he would park his car in a space as near to her Prius as possible. The garage usually opened up at night, after most people left at 5pm or so, so he should be able to tag her easily. She should be an easy catch. 
He could barely contain himself, and his anticipation rippled through his belly all that day. As he thought, the lot had emptied, and the motor of his big Chevy echoed against the concrete walls. He smiled as he navigated his old Chevy next to the yellow Prius, and then he waited. About ten to eight, he opened the driver's door and stood upright. He was stiff from sitting in the front seat for two hours. He crouched low, the big Chevy providing a more than adequate hiding place. His heart almost exploded when he saw her, car keys in her hands and sandals on her pretty feet. He almost laughed aloud in glee, but mustered a self-control he had not known he possessed. He successfully stifled his laughter and smiled as he deftly moved up behind his girl and pressed the dirty rag over her face. She was in his car in a matter of seconds. She was his. Maggie vaguely realized she'd been drugged. She understood she'd been abducted. She was living her worst nightmare, and she swallowed bitter bile, hot on her tongue, as she realized her mouth was taped closed. She knew if she was to survive, she needed to calm down and keep her wits about her. She pushed the terror away, to a place deep inside her where she would claim it later. Now, at this moment, she needed to be practical. She needed to think, to figure out what exactly had happened and how she would deal with it. Maggie was well known among her friends and associates for her brain power and her pragmatism. These two attributes had served her well in the past. She could only hope and pray that they would serve her well now, now in this dark, stinking little room with a big man asleep on the bed. She mentally surveyed her body. She was a little dopey, but otherwise intact. There were restraints keeping her hands at her side. She soon realized they were leather straps, looped in one another and secured to the iron frame upon which the mattress rested. They were buckles. Buckles could likely be manipulated, she thought. Her feet were free, but her heels rested upon a hard surface, something like a wooden plank. Her pant legs had been rolled up to her knees, and for a moment she wondered if she'd been assaulted. She doubted if such a person would bother to redress her. She felt no pain, so she dismissed that possibility. Perhaps he was waiting until she regained consciousness. Maggie could see her captor's large bulk on the bed a few feet away, and hoped to heaven that he was sleeping. She began to twist her hands in the leather straps. Escape might be more difficult than she'd first imagined, but she sure as hell was going to try. She didn't plan to lay there passively, awaiting an unknown and likely horrible fate. She was a fighter, and she wasn't going to play the easy victim for this asshole. One strap's buckle loosened, and her right hand freed itself. The bulk on the bed stirred. Holy fuck! she thought. The adrenaline coursing through her body had replaced any semblance of drug-induced sedation. She frantically, but silently, began to urge the other hand free of its dog-collar restraint. Her thumb was free. The man turned over heavily on the sagging mattress. She knew he was awake now, and she grabbed the other leather strap and reinserted her bruised hand into its confines. Maggie forced herself to close her eyes, but before she did, she caught the glint of an object in the corner. The axe was new and shiny, and propped against the wall just a few feet away. She saw a metal tray lined with syringes and several glass bottles. Her heart was beating against her chest, and she tried frantically to remain calm and think her way out of this nightmare. Breathe, she thought. Breathe. Alexander rose from the bed, his six-foot-four frame hulking its way into the hallway. He had to pee something awful. How long had he been asleep, anyway, he wondered. He couldn't believe he'd fallen asleep with his new girl so near him, so ripe, so ready. He remembered he'd rolled up the legs of her black pants with painstaking care, but had intentionally saved the best for later. Perhaps she would be different. Perhaps she would play the game with him. He truly doubted it, but 
He took off his socks. You never knew. You just never knew. Alexander returned to the darkened room and removed the tape that covered his new girl's lips. He poured a glass of water from the gallon jug in the kitchen. Holding the dirty glass to the girl's mouth, he gently pressed until the water touched her lips. Most of it spilled onto the sides of her mouth, but to his surprise, her lips opened a bit and she actually sipped some water from the glass. Maggie slowly opened her eyes, pretending to be coming up from a place of deep slumber. She was captive, arms at her sides. She would play his game if it meant getting out alive and intact. Maggie instinctively knew this huge, hogging man was the man the newspaper and television had featured for a week or so, and then promptly forgot about. He was the guy for which the police had searched in vain for the last two weeks. He was the asshole who'd taken that girl's feet and left her behind the dumpster to die. He was the bastard who'd kidnapped her from the hospital garage. He was a stuff of nightmares. And he was a sick son of a bitch who needed to be put down like the perverted animal that he was. Hi, Maggie managed to mutter. Alexander almost dropped the syringe that he'd filled with ketamine. None of his girls had ever actually spoken to him. He had no idea what he should do. Would this one be different? Would this one actually play with him? His toes wiggled on the cheap, dirty carpet. The jack had done its job and Detective Spencer had fallen into a heavy but restless slumber on the queen-sized bed he'd shared with his wife before she left him. Too many nights alone, she'd stated simply, and was gone. He slept fitfully, still in his boxer shorts and wife-beater undershirt. He heard the alarm through the fog of alcohol-induced sleep. It seemed as though he'd just drifted off, but he dutifully sat up, dangling his legs off the side of the bed. He would stand in a cold shower for five minutes and revive himself. He had three more hospitals to visit today. One of them had to hold the key. He reached under the bed, groping for his slippers, and his fingers fell upon something nubby and warm. His fingers determined these warm little nubs to be toes, and they wiggled in his hands. The detective sat up in bed with a start. The alarm was ringing its loud, obnoxious song. He didn't reach under the bed for his slippers, but headed straight to the shower, his bare feet numbed to the cold, tile floor. He pushed the dream out of his head. Today is the day, he thought. He could feel it. He and Detective Barnett flashed their badges to the receptionist in Human Resources. The girl lost a shade or two of colour and informed them she would get her supervisor. After a few rounds of higher-ups playing an odd game that reminded the older detective of musical chairs, the two detectives finally settled down in the office of the hospital administrator. The detectives were brusque and to the point, asking for information about any reports of missing drugs, particularly ketamine. So far, none of the hospitals had reported any shortages. The milk toast administrator hesitated with his answer, just a fraction of a second too long and the detectives immediately knew their answer. They quickly asked him for a list of employees who'd been hired within the last six months, and who might have access to laboratories or other sensitive areas where controlled substances were stored. The administrator hesitated again. He spoke of confidentiality in the hospital's reputation and regulations ad nauseum. Detective Spencer's patience was as thin as a razor blade. Look, sir, there's a damn maniac out there, and we have reason to believe that he will do one of two things. Either leave town and never be caught, until, of course, he decides to strike again. Or he is, at this very moment, planning another kidnapping, or maybe already has her. Get the damn files now. The administrator fell silent and scurried into the adjacent room. He returned with two files both containing the addresses and work history of newly hired maintenance workers. Each detective grabbed a file, and Detective Spencer read the work history of the employee in his cardboard folder. 
Alexander had been a maintenance worker with an impeccable record at New York General Hospital for the past 15 years, having only recently moved to New Orleans. We need to speak to this man immediately, Detective Spencer says. Well, let me get his supervisor. The administrator squeaked and began to dial an internal hospital number. He asked to have the employees sent to his office and waited silently for what seemed like an eternity to the detectives. Fine, the administrator said into the receiver and hung up the phone. He's off until Tuesday, the man told the two detectives. The typed address in the employee folder was an Audubon Street all the way uptown. It was half an hour away. The two cops were in the car within minutes, and the blue light on the dash parted traffic as though it was the Red Sea. They could make it in ten minutes if they were lucky. Alexander stood over his girl. Did you say something to me? he asked. Maggie tried to smile, but Alexander thought it was a grimace. Hi, she managed to repeat. She knew she had him off balance. She knew she had to keep him that way, but not uncomfortable enough that he would panic. She tried not to look toward the corner where the axe languished against the wall. She saw the syringe in his big hand. It was loaded with an amber liquid. What's that for? she asked innocently. That's to help you rest, Alexander answered politely. But I'm not tired. Maggie responded, trying to muster up an energy she did not feel. Let's talk for a while, Maggie said. I don't even know who you are or why I'm here. She tried to sound innocent and non-threatening, to sound sincere and interested in this big bulk of a man. Really? Well, I guess we can talk. I don't get to talk to too many people, though. What do you want to talk about? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you tell me who you are? Why did you bring me here? She tried again to sound bright and non-threatening. Do you live here? She thought this was less of an invasive question, and one he could easily answer. I live here, he said. I uh, live here by myself. His answer was terse, and Maggie could detect the distrust in his voice. Oh, can you undo my hands so I can go to the bathroom, please? She asked in a matter-of-fact tone. Alexander had no idea what he should do. None of his girls had ever spoken to him before, much less asked to go to the job. He didn't see what harm it would do, and, and if he was nice to her, and she liked him enough, maybe she would play a little piggies with him. His toes wiggled again. Alexander didn't notice the leather restraint straps were already somewhat loosened as he unbuckled them, and his girl stood her hands out. She sat up and, after a few seconds, rose unsteadily to her feet. She asked him where she might find the bathroom. He pointed to the hallway and told her it was the door to the left. Maggie stumbled her way across the room and opened the door to the dirty, stinking room that housed a disgusting sink and an even more disgusting toilet. She squatted, peed, and washed her hands. She splashed cold water onto her face and stared at her reflection in the grimy mirror. She didn't know what day it was or how long she'd been out. She suspected it was Sunday, as she'd closed the shop on Saturday night and her last memory had been walking to her car with her keys lodged firmly between her fingers. If it was Sunday, she wouldn't be missed until Monday afternoon when she didn't show up for work. In the two years Maggie had worked at the gift shop, She'd never been late, much less absent from work. She was known for being responsible, and the fact she hadn't shown up and had not called in would surely set off alarms with her supervisor. She just had to survive until then. She just had to buy some time, regardless of what it might cost her. Maggie returned to the darkened room. She was too unsteady to try to figure out where the front door was, and whether there was a back door to this dingy apartment. She would play this out. She would wait until she was sure she knew her legs would support her in a dash to freedom. Hey, 
she said as though she had known her abductor for years. She sat upright on the bed and noticed for the first time that it was covered in vinyl. What's your name? As soon as she asked, she realized she had made a mistake. The look on the man's face confirmed her fear. She'd gotten too personal. She had overstepped. She quickly added, I'm Maggie. She remembered an article she'd read years ago about being kidnapped. It suggested to the reader that if you established some type of relationship with your abductor, made yourself human, you would stand a chance of survival. She continued with a quick, I work at the gift shop in the hospital, pretending not to know that he likely already knew that. She realized she was jabbering and became silent, waiting for a response. You, um, want to play a game? The big man asked sullenly. It seemed as though he expected a negative response. Sure, Maggie answered. What did you have in mind? I have the best game, Alexander said with an enthusiasm he could not hide. My mama used to play it with me, he said, and then blushed a dark red, realizing that his girl might think he was just a big baby. R really? Maggie answered quickly. I love playing games with my mum. She quickly put him at an unexpected, albeit relative, ease. Did she play Little Piggies with you? Alexander asked incredulously. She did, Maggie answered. She did. I remember that game. Maggie was in uncharted waters and could only hope to wing her way through this bizarre reality. You want to play it with me? Alexander asked the inevitable question. We can take turns. Alexander was almost beside himself with anticipation. Sure, Maggie answered with uh, false enthusiasm. She glanced down at the man's big feet. His toes were flexing in ecstasy. She noticed the black toe jam that shifted with each flex. She fought a wave of nausea. Okay, I'll go first, the big man offered. Let me see your little piggy. Maggie sat back on the little bed and put her feet onto the vinyl cover. Alexander sat on the edge of the bed and pulled her feet into his massive lap. This little pea went to market. He gently tugged on her big toe. This little piggy stayed at home. He tweaked her next toe. This little piggy had roast beef. He tugged her middle toe. And this little piggy had none. He almost squealed. And this little piggy cried wee 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 all the way home. The big man began to cry, to sob. He was filled with joy and sorrow, with love found and love lost. Maggie's overt fear and disgust of the man began to drip away slowly vanishing to be replaced by a tremendous ache in her heart. She pretended not to notice his tears or see his shoulders heave with sobs. Come on then, she told him. Give me those piggies, put them in my lap, she instructed with a smile. Alexander turned to her, unable to believe her words. Surely he'd misunderstood. He wiped his nose and eyes with the sleeve of his shirt. Really? he asked. Really? And Alexander was three again and scooted onto the bed, heaving his huge feet onto the lap of his girl. He would remember to ask her name, but now she so gently grasped his big toe between her thumb and index finger and began to shake it gently and recite his favourite rhyme. This... Little piggy went to market, she said softly and with a smile. This little piggy stayed home, she continued. Alexander retreated into the past, into a time of unbridled happiness and absolute innocence. He was happy. He could hear his mother say what a good boy he was, what a terribly good boy. 
This little piggy had roast beef, Maggie continued, and this little piggy had none, and this little piggy cried wee wee wee. There was a series of loud knocks at what Maggie thought must be the front door, and then a crash. Alexander made a mad dash for the axe and ran into the front of the shed where he rushed at the two detectives, the big blade swinging. Maggie was surprised at the grace with which Alexander deftly lodged the huge, shiny weapon into the side of the young detective. Blood gushed. The blade sliced the detective's liver neatly in half. Detective Spencer fired his 9mm straight into the perp's chest. The big man didn't miss a step and lunged at the detective, the bloody axe still in his big hand. Maggie spotted the discarded syringe with the amber liquid, and within a few seconds she had jammed its long needle into the back of the madman's neck. She pushed the plunger in as far as it would go. Alexander brushed aside the syringe as though it was a pesky, stinging bug. He started, and looked at Maggie for a long second with hurt and disbelief. He had trusted her. How could she? The distraction had provided the few seconds needed by Detective Spencer to unload another round of bullets, this time into Alexander's head. The big man's head exploded, much as his mother's had those many years ago, the wall catching the back of his skull and most of his brain. Maggie fell onto the cot and began to sob from relief for herself and for a deep sadness for the big man. Detective Spencer went into cop mode and radioed for a bus, but the young detective had lost too much blood. He died in his partner's arms, having never regained consciousness. The old detective wondered how it was that he had been granted his 63 years of life, how it was he had seen all that he'd seen and wondered darkly if his longevity was a curse or a blessing. Sometimes... Most of the time, life made little or no sense, he thought. No sense at all. Alexander's massive bulk lay sprawled on the floor, his blood pooling around him, staining the dirty carpet to burgundy red. He was lifeless now, finally at peace. He wasn't really a bad man. He could hear his mother's voice now. He's such a good boy. He's such a terribly good boy. Well, I don't know about you, my friends, but I thought that one was brilliant. Oh, yes, indeed. <sighs> oh, another one from Dr. Creepens Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all back to you. Have you got a story for me? You have, haven't you? You're thinking, oh, should I send it to him? Well, I can't guarantee I will read it, but I will definitely look at it and, you know, give it a chance. So, please send it across. Oh, my dear friends, that's Monday. Oh, I only did what, another story for you yesterday, didn't I? Will there be one on Wednesday? Of course there will. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and as of recently, Sunday as well. Well, oh yeah, forgetting the second channel. Lots more coming up on that as well. So if you haven't subscribed to the second channel, get over there and subscribe for some shorter stories. And that is definitely enough for me for one evening. So, until next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?